The time is at hand. The elusive dog-like creature attacks livestock, bleeding them dry of blood. Eight to ten feet tall, shadowy aliens. But I am telling you right now. We need a great reset. And this, and this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Welcome to In Dark Places. I'm your Huckleberry, Junebug Fugit. You know that place, Burger King? <laughs> I took Brandon there uh, Sunday night on September 1st. And he wanted a Whopper Junior in a combo meal with onion rings. And I got the Fiery Bacon Whopper. Tried that thing? That's good. Brandon got the combo with a drink. I did not. The guy asked me, do you want that in a combo or just a sandwich? I said, just a sandwich. Because they're huge. It's enough to fill you up. He said, that'll be eleven seventy-one, And I thought that was a little cheap for today's standards. <laughs> it's impossible to eat out nowadays. It costs you an arm and a leg. So we're in the drive-thru. We drive around. I pay the guy. He gives me the bag and Brandon's drink, and I just drive off, because, you know, we were the only ones in line, and Brandon was laughing and said, I wonder how bad they messed up the order. They messed it up pretty bad. <laughs> Brandon's Whopper Jr. and Onion Rings were in the bag with an order of mozzarella sticks. <laughs> how do you mistake a fiery bacon Whopper for mozzarella sticks? And even ask me if I just wanted the sandwich. I'm confused. And as I got the bag from the guy at the window and stuff, his name badge said he was the manager. The manager messed up my order like that. Was this guy experiencing some sort of time slip? Or did he time travel or something? Nice segue, huh? This week on the show, more strange time travel stories. This is Mr. Haunted, your In Dark Places news correspondent, with some breaking news. Co-workers leave hiker behind during office retreat, rescued the next day. And this is out of Salidas, Colorado. A man rescued on a Colorado mountain was lost overnight after his co-worker left him behind during a hike on an office retreat. A group of 15 hikers on an office retreat left the Blanks Cabin trailhead at sunrise on August 29th, according to a Facebook post. One group set off to the summit of Mount Shivano, and another hiked to the mountain pass between Mount Shivano and Mount Tabugash. And what might cause some awkward encounters at the office in the coming days and weeks one member of their party was left to complete his final summit push alone. The man summited the mountain alone and reached the peak at about 11.30 a.m. However, he became disoriented on his way back down. At some point, he found himself in a steep boulder field on the slopes toward Shavano Lake. Concerned for his safety, he sent his location to his co-workers, they reportedly told him he had gone the wrong way and that he needed to hike back up to rejoin the trail. The man continued with his descent. At about 3.50 p.m., he sent his location again to his co-workers, letting them know he was back on the ridge between the two mountains near the trail. However, just after he sent the message, a storm passed through with freezing rains and high winds. The man reportedly disoriented again in the storm and lost cell service. Um, CCAR South was activated at about 9 p.m. and deployed two teams and a drone pilot starting at the same trailhead. 
They focused their search on the Mount Shivano standard route to the man's last lo known location and the Shivano Lake Squaw Creek drainage. High winds and freezing rain hindered their search, making it impossible for searchers to safely summit the mountain and causing problems for the drone pilot. A helicopter was also deployed, but couldn't make out any other lights besides those of the search teams. Crews searched the night until 9 a.m. the next day, but couldn't find a trace of the missing man. It's almost 24 hours now. At about 10 a.m., a second search was launched with more resources and assistance, which included several other rescue teams from nearby counties. As the crews began a larger search effort, the missing man regained enough cell service to call 911. Thanks to his call, crews were able to locate him above the North Fork drainage in a gully below Esperit Point. According to officials, the man reportedly became very disoriented on his way down the mountain and fell several times down the steep slopes towards North Fork. It was reported that he had his last fall. He couldn't get back up, but fortunately had enough cell service to call for help. After locating the man, the crews worked to rescue him using a rope system to extract him. He was, -trans he was transported to the hospital for additional care. They didn't comment on the man's condition. Um, they also said that he was phenomenally lucky to have regained cell service and be able to call 911. They advised hikers to take the proper precautions when visiting the back country. We'd also, again, like to remind everyone recre recreating in the back country to always hike with a partner, pack some bright clothing, and remember to toss the 10 essentials in your backpack. Now, I just want to go back to the... Uh, one of the earlier sentences here. Here it is. And what might cause some awkward encounters at the office in the coming days and weeks, one member of their party was left to complete his final summit push alone. So this guy here, Johnny, whatever his name is, he went hiking with a bunch of his friends from the office. And... He got lost, and they just freaking left him there. Bye-bye. Holy mackerels. Back to you, Junebug. Hey, there he is. Jimmy Haunted. Thank you, sir. We talked about the Philadelphia Experiment way back on episode 16. It's been a while. The Philadelphia Experiment is the name given to an alleged top-secret experiment conducted by the United States Navy in 1943 in which a ship was rendered invisible and teleported from one dock to another. It is a story that should be known to anyone interested in UFOs, the Bermuda Triangle, and other myths and mysteries. And in 1979, it was the subject of a book by Charles Berlitz, High guru of the Bermuda Triangle cult and William Moore. But how did this story come to be told and what evidence is there that it is true? The tale begins with Morris Ketchum Jessup, a man with many and varied interests. In the 1920s he had taught astronomy and mathematics at Drake University. Jessup spent much time studying Maya and Incan ruins and concluded that the original buildings could have been constructed only through the assistance of a superior technology from another world. Lack of money forced him to abandon his research and return to the United States, where he began work on the case for the UFO, the first four books on the subject, in which he mixed a little scientific objectivity with a lot of pseudoscience. The story of the Philadelphia Experiment is based largely on information contained in two letters sent in 1956 by Carlos Allende, also known as Carl Allen, to Morris Jessup. In these rambling letters full of spelling and punctuation errors, Allende warned Jessup against furthering his interest in unified field theory. An application of the theory had been used by the United States Navy in 1943, he said, 
in an experiment in which a ship was rendered invisible with terrible side effects on the crew. He said, My dear Dr. Jessup, your invocation to the public that they move in mass upon their representatives and have thusly enough pressure placed at the right and sufficient number of places where from a law demanding research into Dr. Albert Einstein's unified field theory may be enacted is not at all necessary. Results of my friend Dr. Franklin Reno were used. The result was and stands today as proof that the unified field theory to a certain extent is correct. The result was complete. Invisibility of a ship, destroyer type, and all of its crew. While at sea in October 1943, the field was effective in an oblate spherical shape extending 100 yards more or less due to lunar position and latitude out from each beam of the ship. Any person within that sphere became vague in form but he too had observed those persons aboard that ship as though they were two of that same state yet were walking upon nothing. Any person without that sphere could see the clearly defined shape of the ship hull in the water. There are only a few of the original experimental DE's crew lift by now, sir. Most went insane. One just walked through his quarters wall in sight of his wife and child of two. Other crew members were never seen again. Two went into the flame, i.e. they froze and caught fire while carrying common small boat compasses. They burned for 18 days. The experiment was a complete success. The men were complete failures. Check Philadelphia papers for a tiny one paragraph, upper half of the sheet, inside the paper near the rear third of the paper, 1944 to 1946, in spring or fall, or winter, not summer, of an item describing the sailors' actions. After their initial voyage, they raided a local to the Navy Yard gin mill or beer joint and caused such shock and paralysis of the waitresses that little comprehension could be gotten from them, save that paragraph and the writer of it. Does not believe it and says, I wrote what I heard and them dames is Daffy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I ask you to do this bit of research simply that you may choke on your own tongue when you remember what you have appealed be made law. Very disrespectfully yours, Carl Allen. P.S. will help more if you see where I can. And then days later, notes in addition to pertaining to missive. I wish to mention that somehow also the experimental ship disappeared from its Philadelphia dock and only a very few minutes later appeared at the other dock in the Norfolk, Newport News, Portsmouth area. This was distinctly and clearly identified as being that place but the ship then again disappeared and went back to its Philadelphia dock in only a very few minutes or less. This was also noted in the newspapers, but I forgot what paper I read it in, or when it happened. Probably late in experiments. May have been in 1956, after the experiments were discontinued. I cannot say for sure. Very sincerely, Carl Allen. Jessup replied to the letter and asked for further details. And then, Dear Dr. Jessup, you asked me for what is tenement to positive proof of something that only the duplication of those devices that produced this phenomenon could ever give you. I could never possibly satisfy such an attitude. I can be of some positive help for you in myself, but to do so would require a hypnotist, sodium pentanol, a tape recorder, and an excellent typist secretary in order to produce material of real value to you. I am a stargazer, Mr. Jessup. I make no bones about this. 
and the fact that I feel sure that man will go where he now dreams of being to the stars via the form of transport that the Navy accidentally stumbled upon to their embarrassment when their experimental ship took off and popped up a minute or so later on several hundred sea travel trip miles away. Perhaps already the Navy has used this accident of transport to build your UFOs. It is a logical advance from any standpoint. What do you think? Very respectfully yours, Carl Allen. What if any inquiries were made by Jessup are unknown and his direct involvement in the affair came to an end on the evening of April 20th, 1959 when he was found dead in his estate wagon in Dade County Park, Florida. A hose leading into the closed car had been attached to the exhaust pipe. Jessup had killed himself. Or had he? Yeah. <laughs> That's my thought. You know, they make it look like a suicide. Jessup's death has been the subject of considerable speculation. Some friends have said that Jessup was not the sort of person that would kill himself. Others have suggested that he was murdered when he refused to abandon research into the UFO enigma. Also involved are said to be the men in black. However, other friends have said that Jessup was depressed about personal problems and that he had sent a suicide note to a close friend. But yeah, again, they make it look like a suicide. Of Jessup's correspondence with Carlos Miguel Allende slash Carl Allen, little was known. After Jessup's death, Charles Berlitz and William Moore were able to track down Carl Allen, and they determined that the ship used in the alleged experiment was the USS Eldridge. It is Allende's claim that in 1943, a certain Dr. Franklin Reno developed an application of Einstein's unified field theory that was used by the United States Navy in an experiment in which the USS Eldridge and her entire crew were rendered invisible. The experiment was conducted at sea in October 1943 and witnessed by Allende from aboard the steamer SS Andrew Forsyth. He told Berlitz and Moore that the Eldridge was bathed in a strange force field which extended 100 yards out from each beam of the ship. I actually shoved my hand up to the elbow into this unique field, he said. The experiment was a success except for the terrible and bizarre side effects experienced by the crew. Some of the men died, others were insane, and a few continued to lapse into invisibility. Once in the dockside bar in Philadelphia, a number of the crew caused an uproar when they suddenly vanished. And they said that the incident was reported in a Philadelphia newspaper in the autumn or winter, sometime between 1944 and 1946. And they also said that a further experiment was conducted in which the experimental vessel was teleported from its Philadelphia dock to another dock in the area of Newport News, Virginia. The story of the Philadelphia experiment has been circulating since 1956. During that time, the United States Navy has not only consistently and emphatically denied that such an experiment took place in 1943, they have maintained that the technology required for such an experiment does not exist, even now. And people just went along with it and believed it. Well, they said it didn't happen, so it probably didn't, I guess, because they said so. In 1976, the Department of Transportation, United States Coast Guard, retrieved the crew records, and they confirmed that Linde was on board the Andrew Forsyth in October of 1943, as Linde said in his letter to Morris Jessup. Linde swore that he was not making the story up, and as far as we know, no one has ever come forward to confirm or refute Linde's story, nor has the Forsyth captain, William S. Dodge, or any other member of the crew. According to Berlitz and Moore, the deck logs of the USS Eldridge are unavailable and we must rely on the official history compiled by the Department of the Navy as the main source of information. This states that the Eldridge was launched on July 25, 1943 and commissioned on August 27th. From September to December 28th, 
She combined escort duty with shakedown operations in the Bermuda, British, West Indies area. This was followed by a three-day training period at Block Island, and from there the Eldridge went to Hampton Roads, Virginia, to await her first overseas escort assignment. Between January 4, 1944, and May 9, 1945, Eldridge made nine voyages delivering convoys to Casablanca, Berserte, and Oran. She was then transferred to the Pacific and remained there until the end of the war. She was placed out of commission on June 17, 1946, and sold to Greece on January 5, 1951. Berlitz and Moore believe that this uneventful history has been doctored. They unearthed the engineer's log and an action report filed by the Eldridge's captain, which revealed that on November 2, 1943, Eldridge left Brooklyn to round up some vessels separated from convoy GUS-22 by a hurricane and to escort them to their destination. The Andrew Forsyth was a part of the convoy GUS-22 and could have been escorted by Eldridge. Furthermore, on November 20th, Eldridge was involved in minor action about 200 miles off the coast of Casablanca. Eldridge's first overseas escort duty was not, therefore, in January 1944, but in November 1943. There was also a discrepancy as to when the ship was launched. So that's how the story of the Philadelphia experiment started. And then Al Bielik, Duncan Cameron and Preston Nichols came along and shared their side of the story. They were on board the USS Eldridge and disappeared when the experiments were happening. While the ship was gone, Duncan, Ed, and Preston time traveled to 1983. So were these just some bored dudes that read the Philadelphia Experiment book and then they just decided to run with it so they could make a book? Or were they actually on board? Duncan Cameron is still alive, and he kind of refuses to talk about the Philadelphia Experiment anymore. So unless he changes his mind and comes back, then we're probably not going to know much more about it. Al Bielik and Preston Nichols have both passed away. Al Bielik would often talk about time traveling into the future on several occasions, and my offer still stands. If you're out there, Al Bielik, time traveling into the future and you come up on this podcast, send me an email in darkplacespod at hotmail.com. I'd love to talk to you. Breaking News! Woman dies on way to work after a wrench crashes through windshield. This is out of Montgomery, Alabama. A family of a woman killed in an unusual accident is seeking answers. Early Harris died after a wrench flew through the windshield of the car she was traveling in on an Interstate 65 earlier this month. Her family says they're still trying to come to terms with her tragic death. She was the glue that held everything together. I mean, through ups and downs. She was always there, her son Cedric Harris said. Cedric Harris was taking his mother to work that day when the wrench went through the windshield, striking and killing early Harris. All of a sudden, something threw, flew through the window. I ducked down and looked up, and my mom was bleeding, and I pulled off the interstate. The Harris family still does not know where exactly the wrench came from, they believe it came off a truck driving north on I-65. They are working with the Beasley Allen Law Firm to try to find the driver of the vehicle the wrench came from. If it's something you can't miss, something out there, somebody out there saw the object fall, bouncing down the street, attorney LeBaron Boone said, didn't hit them, but maybe they just continued. But it did end up killing Miss Early Harris, an unbelievable servant. The Harris family just want answers. They say Early Harris was a loving mother and grandmother. The law firm is offering a $1,000 reward. Hold on. $1 million. Let's hear that again. 
One million dollars. So you're telling me you're trying to find these mysteries that killed this woman with a wrench through her windshield, and you're offering one thousand dollar reward. You could do better. Do better, Alabama. One million. This is Mr. Haunted for In Dark Places. Back to you, Junebug. More news. Thanks, Jimmy. One thousand dollars. Quite the reward. We have a letter. This was sent in by Eileen. The Philadelphia experiment reminds me of something very strange that happened to me a few years ago. It was my custom to sit late at night in the large lounge of my old house. I was sitting in the lighted room. There was a 75 watt bulb burning in a central fitment. When I observed something very strange. My attention was drawn to the bay window area of the room. The space had filled with a green haze. The actual window was discernible, but I could not see out of it. The small Sheraton table had disappeared, and so had the chairs on either side of it, and the figurines on the table. I looked around the room. Everything was normal. The whole experience lasted for about a half an hour. I should like to emphasize that I was not in any state of medication, and my eyes were wide open. The account of the Philadelphia experiment, with the green haze appearing around it right before it vanished, brought my own experience to mind. Thanks, Eileen. Kind of makes me wonder now, has green haze been associated with any other time slips or time traveling experiments or anything like that? Weird. Here's a possible time slip story. I've never experienced genuine death where my heart stops, but I have had experiences where I narrowly avoided death. About eight years ago, I was driving to work in my little green Ford Focus. It had snowed overnight, but had already started melting by that time. So traffic was moderate and moving at and above 65 miles an hour. Out of nowhere, I hit black ice and did a full 360 on the highway. I remember time seemed to slow down and everything became incomprehensible. I don't know why I did it, perhaps reacting to the fact that I was suddenly facing oncoming traffic, but I threw it in reverse and even remember flashing a terrified smile to the commuters I was suddenly facing. The car ended up narrowly avoiding a guardrail and careening backward into a tree with a branch piercing the rear window. I even got a picture that shows how close to hitting that guardrail I was. But aside from a sore back and a totaled car, I was unharmed. And I didn't hit anyone else either, despite there being lots of other cars on the road. So that's about the time I believe I jumped. From a universe where I died in the accident, to one where I didn't. And maybe that's what we all do. Jumping into branches of time where we survive completely unaware of the timelines where we don't. And that's reassuring to me that in other universes, the people I've mourned throughout my life are still surviving just elsewhere. I just wish that I had a way of telling the people in that other branch where I died that I'm okay where I am now. Here's a story I found in the book called Phantom Messages. Written by William J. Hall and me, which includes chilling phone calls, letters, emails, and texts from unknown realms. Now, this one here is from Ida Lupino in 1942. So, this Ida Lupino was an actor and the only one ever to star in and direct an episode of The Twilight Zone. The episode was called The 16 Millimeter Shrine. Her parents were London stage performers. Ida's grandmother often took care of her while her parents were away performing. One night, when Ida was a child, the phone rang at her grandmother's house where she was staying. Ida answered the phone and heard her father's friend Andrew on the line. He said in a monotone, emotionless voice, Stanley, I must speak with Stanley. 
It's very important. Ida said hello to Uncle Andy, as she called him, and explained that her parents were out performing. Andrew repeated, I need to speak with Stanley. Ida relayed the message to her grandmother, who was confused by what Ida was telling her, so she grabbed the phone and listened to Andrew repeat his request. She asked, Andrew, are you ill? Instead of Andrew answering, the line went dead. She called the operator to ask what number just called out, and the operator said no calls were made to her number in more than an hour. That night, Ida was allowed to stay awake until her parents came home. Her grandmother told them about the call they received and the request Andrew made. Connie, Ida's mother, had to sit down. She looked like she was going to pass out. Her father turned pale and said that Andrew could never have called. The grandmother insisted that he did call and that they should call him back since he didn't like he didn't sound like he was well. Finally, her father said, Mom, Andrew is dead. He hanged himself three days ago. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Somewhere around 2005, I woke up in my house alone to get ready for work one morning. At the time, I was working at a coffee place, and I had to get up super early to open up shop. I had a very consistent and habitual routine when waking up and getting ready for my opening shift. This was the same shift I worked four out of five days during my work week, which was 5.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. My routine was the same every morning. Get up at 4.20, brush my teeth, take a shower, dry off, go to my bedroom, pick out my work clothes, put on makeup, take hair out of the towel, and brush and tie my hair up from my face. Then leave the house by 5.20 and catch a ride to work. My work was only about seven minutes away from my house. To do all these things to get ready for work, it always took me one hour. I always ended up leaving the house somewhere between 5.19 and 5.21. So not much of a variance in how long I take to leave. But this one particular morning, something weird happened. I did my usual routine. My alarm went off at 4.20. I got ready at my usual pace, as I always do. I went to the bathroom, do my showering and whatnot, as always. I went to my bedroom, put on a CD to listen to while I got dressed. I finished getting ready. I looked at the clock as I'm about to leave. The clock did not say 5.20. Somehow, it was only 4.45. I had somehow gained an extra half hour of time, or rather, I somehow went back in time about a half an hour. I distinctly remember what album I was listening to at the time during the morning in question. It was Panic at the Disco, a fever you can't sweat, which is a 39 minute long album. When I got out of the bathroom to finish getting ready in my bedroom, put that album on in my CD player, I played that 39 minute long album from start to finish and listened to every song. But according to my clock, right before I left, only 25 minutes had passed. It was only 4.45. At this point I double checked all the clocks in my house, which all said the same time, 4.45 a.m. No, my alarm clock wasn't broken. It was a digital clock that plugged into the wall. And I also looked at the clock inside my bedroom right before I hopped into the shower which said 423 at that time. All my clocks in my house said the exact same time when I looked after realizing I was ready for work over half an hour earlier than possible. How did I gain the extra half hour plus get ready within 25 minutes when I knew for a fact that I listened to the entire album which is exactly 39 minutes. Crazy I know. I don't know if this is dimension jumping or not, but I have, every few years, experienced something that I've never been able to explain that started when I was around 13. The school I went to was about 30 minutes away from the school where my mom worked. So every day after school, my grandma would pick me up, drive me to her house, where we'd wait until around 6 when my mom got off work. 
Every day I had a routine. When I get there, I would eat a sandwich, watch some TV, and then take a nap. So this day was no different. I made my afternoon snack, watched some TV, and passed out. When I woke up, though, that's when things got weird. As I was sleeping, I heard this voice saying my name. Wake up, it's time to go. So I woke up and looked around. And I had absolutely no idea where I was at. I sit up realizing something is wrong, and I see this lady walking around my room, grabbing all my stuff, in what looked like a hurry. She was clearly a little irritated with me, but I had no idea who she was. Again, she said, My name. I'm serious. Get up so we can go home. I don't want to wait too long to feed Luna. I stared at her with no idea who this person was, who Luna was, who I was, where I was, or why we were leaving. She caught me staring at her after about three minutes and said, Hey, are you okay? And all of a sudden, everything came flooding back. I remembered this person was my mom. I was me, and Luna was our puppy at home. It completely freaked me out, so I just said, yeah, I was just sleepy, and never told her about it until years later. Since then, this has happened to me five other times, over about 15 years, and every time I have no idea who I am, where I am, or who the people around me are. This even happened with my husband, who I've been with for some time. I woke up and freaked out, because I had no idea who he was, for about five minutes, and had to calm down because this random man was laying next to me, and I had no idea who he was. I've had multiple MRIs and brain scans done, and everything has always come back normal. I've never had any kind of head trauma or anything, so I don't really know what it's about. But it does feel like I'm a shell, and then suddenly have a personality downloaded into it. I don't know if it's jumping, but it weirds me out. That's the end of the big show for this week. We are woefully out of time. Hope you enjoyed it. I love me some Philadelphia Experiment and time slips and just anything dealing with time travel. Big fun. Thanks as always, Jimmy Haunted. Shout out Paul Chadwick. You are in our prayers, sir. Thanks for listening. We'll see you right here next week. God bless.